Welcome to our kickoff meeting for our group this evening, and this is the most important meeting we're going to have because we're going to get off on the right foot, and we've always done a pretty good job in telehome planning. The criticism I've heard over the years has been in the implementation. So we want your input tonight, and as we go through this process of our comprehensive development plan, so that you'll have buy-in and can help us implement this plan. This evening we have some some of our aldermen that are in, in the house, and if you are, I don't remember seeing all of the aldermen here, but uh, if you are an alderman, would you please stand? You'll be a big part of this. So, see Alderman Barry, Alderman McGee, uh, and, and Rupa Blackwell, and I'm missing uh, one or two other aldermen somewhere. Did I see you? John, you here? <laughs> okay. Anyway, all the aldermen, thank you for being here tonight. You're a big part of this team. But anyway, thank you for being here this evening. Of course, we have our distinguished state representative with us tonight, Nurse Brickin. Thank you for being here. So thank you for all the citizens of Tallahoma that are going to help put this plan together and then implement this plan successfully. So thank you for being here. Um, so my name is Phil Walker. I'm with the Walker Collaborative. I'm a uh, planning consultant and I'm the project manager for this project. Uh, let me introduce some of my team members. On the far left, we got Keith Covington, who is a uh, architect, urban designer, and planner with Common Ground Urban Design Plus Planning. Um, next to Keith is Randall Gross. Randy is a strategic planner and economist. And next to Randy is uh, Liesel Gothert who was born and raised right here in Tullahoma. And she is, she is a, Liesl is a transportation planner. And also with her firm KCI, we've got Kayla Ferguson, who's not at this particular meeting, but she's a civil engineer and traffic engineer. So, so that's the consultant team. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got several steering committee. The, the steering committee is really critical to this project. They, you know, guide the whole thing. and. Uh, provide information back to their various constituents and um, help kind of serve as cheerleaders towards the end of the plan to, to get the plan adopted and, and they're really important. So tonight what we're going to be doing is first of all we're going to give you kind of an overview of the project. For example, you know, what is a comprehensive plan? What are the steps we're going to take to, to create it? Uh, we're going to go through some initial observations, just kind of early stuff that uh, each of us will talk about. And then we're going to spend the rest of the time really in a conversation with you. We're going to ask you what you think the uh, key challenges and opportunities are for Tullahoma. And, uh, and then look at maybe other communities you might have visited sometime that there may be some aspect of that we could try to adapt in Tullahoma. Not to become another community, but there may be some, some feature somewhere else. Just to, just to think about. So anyway, that's what we're going to do tonight. So, so what is a comprehensive plan? Well, it is a blueprint for the growth and development of your community. And the term, they call it comprehensive because it is indeed comprehensive in nature. It addresses things like land use and development and transportation, the natural environment, historic resources, economic development, housing, all those sorts of things. And any good plan is going to answer uh, four questions. Where are we now? In other words, when we study your existing conditions, um, you know, taking a snapshot of where Tullahoma is right now, where are we headed? And that's looking at sort of trends, you know, looking at growth and so forth. Um, where do you want to go? And that's where you come in in particular because this isn't going to be our plan. The consultants are just a vehicle that gets you to your plan. So what your vision is, what you want to see for Tullahoma is, is the, you know, where do we want to go part of it. And then finally, how do we get there? That's where the consultants come in to figure, figure that out from a technical point of view. So anyway, that's, that's what a comprehensive plan is in general. Um, so why, why would you want to prepare a comprehensive plan? Well, first of all, to build consensus. I mean, if you don't have a plan to go by, your community is going to end up being determined by, you know, a hundred different decisions by a hundred different people and you don't have everybody on the same page going towards that vision that you want. So it's really important is, is just a vehicle to build consensus. It's also the basis for your zoning. You know, one of the things we'll do with this plan is we'll come up with what we call the place types map. You know, years ago we used to call it a land use map, a land use plan, but we look at place types 
being more than just land use, it's also development density and form and character, right? And so when that plan is developed, you'll probably update your zoning to reflect that. Um, to secure funding for projects, you know, whenever the city, and, and your city has had great success over the years getting grants, but when they do that, they compete with other communities, right? And if you are going after a grant for a particular project, and that project is part of a broader plan, a comprehensive plan, you're going to be a whole lot more competitive. So that's another reason to do a comprehensive plan. Also, just to improve your quality of life. And not only the quality of life for the citizens, which obviously is the, the first objective, but also when it comes to business and industrial recruitment, you know, there are certain things that the community needs to have to kind of check the boxes that these companies look at. Things like greenways or bike lanes or, um, you know, just a, whole, a, a vibrant downtown, things like that. So, um, so that's another reason for a comprehensive plan. And then finally, just to be really strategic and, and efficient with your spending on public improvements. Uh, you know, tying it again back to a plan. So those are some of the reasons why you might want to do one. Um, you know, a lot of times when we do a project like this, people wonder, well, how does this relate? You know, we've done a lot of plans over the years. How does this relate to those? And, you know, there have been, like all communities do planning on a pretty regular basis, just like major businesses do planning periodically. And, um, you know, a lot of those plans have been implemented. Now, no plan is ever 100% implemented. I've rarely seen a plan that wasn't implemented at all. It's always a matter of degrees. Um, and what we will do is look at all the previous plans that have been done over the years, particularly the more recent ones, and see what there is that might still be viable that we can fit into this plan. So it's basically a five-step process for this project. And we, we're just now, you know, this is our first official team trip to Tullahoma. And this is the project kickoff and research, so we'll do a lot of background. We got a great tour today uh, by Mary and Winston and, and the mayor. Uh, all over, you know, went all over town. We're going to spend the next two days kind of on our own doing field work. Of course, we got this meeting tonight. Um, the next step, uh, task two, is a visioning and economic assessment and analysis. And with the visioning, we're going to do a series of stakeholder meetings with with different, you know, groups, kind of, you know, groups that have a particular interest in whether it's the environment or neighborhoods or development or things like that. We're also going to have a series of meetings by quadrant you know your city lays out beautifully into four quadrants by the two major roads and we're going to be doing a meeting at, at a school in each of the quadrants to kind of you know try to get it a little more localized for that group and then uh, the, another part of the uh, the visioning uh, our part of task two is is randy as an economist is going to be looking at issues tied specifically to housing and to e economic development and then with task three, the charrette and concept plan. And I don't know how familiar you are with the term charrette, but basically it's a multi-day intensive brainstorming session that involves the public in a really hands-on way to come up with the key ideas for a plan. And so what we'll do, it's gonna be a five-day thing, and on the first evening, we'll have a big public workshop. And I always describe it as, as essentially deputizing the citizens to be planners for the evening because we break people up after we kind of give an initial findings uh, presentation we break people up into teams of like eight to ten people each team is at a table each table is a big base map there's a, a bunch of colored markers we kind of guide these different teams through their own process to come up with their concept plan and at the end of the night each team will present their ideas and uh and there are always some ideas now not all the ideas are, are viable but there's always ideas that are. And what we do is use that exercise as kind of the springboard for our team for the next four days to come up with the overall concept plan, which is kind of the, the skeletal system of the ultimate detailed comprehensive plan. And then on that last night, the fifth day, we'll present the concept plan, probably in a, a space like this, maybe bigger, because it looks like <laughs> we, we could use a little more space. Um, but but we'll, we'll, you know, sound out our first ideas and see what people think, what they like, what they don't like. And then we go back and we do the plan document, right? And then we provide the plan document. Everybody can scrutinize that in detail. We come back, present that. And again, we, you know, get comments, see what people like or don't and revise it. And then you have your final plan. Now, planning is easy, but the tricky part is implementation. We'll, we'll talk about that later, but you, we'll definitely have a section of the plan on implementation because that's the focus. There's no point in doing this if it's going to sit on the proverbial shelf gathering dust, right? So, so we do put a big emphasis on uh, implementation. 
So we're going to talk now about just some really, you know, kind of high level initial observations. And since I love history, I'm going to start off with the history. And as most of you probably know, Tullahoma was founded in 1852. It was a work camp on the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad. And uh, there's, there's debate on the actual origin of the word Tullahoma. It's definitely an Indian word. Um, but anyway, uh, in 1861, you know, the Civil War starts and they raised a, a company of an of a, a infantry regiment that went east. 1863, there were major camps, uh, Confederate camps here, and uh, but, but they were forced out when the Union Army had the, the famous Tullahoma campaign that, that forced them uh, all the way past Chattanooga. 1900, roughly, you know, by 1900, the railroad had helped, you know, the economy was, was pretty bad after the Civil War. The railroad helped, you know, with the recovery. And then there was these resorts that popped up because of the springs. Um, 1924, General Shoe Corporation started, which of course went on to become Genesco. 1926, the state established Camp P as a National Guard training camp. Uh, and it later, you know, merged with Camp Force uh, just before World War II. Eventually it was a POW camp. And I'm sure most of y'all know all about that. That, that could be a, a lecture in itself. 1939, uh, 41A was built through town, which was a major uh, you know, impetus for more growth. Uh, 1941, the Tennessee maneuvers occurred at Camp Force, and uh, George Patton was part of that. Uh, 1951, the Arnold Engineering Development Complex uh, was started. 1964, UT Space Institute was established here. And then 1969, Motlow State Community College was established. Now it's just outside of the, the city uh, boundaries, but it's obviously an important part of the community. So, so anyway, those are just some key dates. These are some neat. Luckily, you've got a pretty good collection of historic photos, and these two in the top here are basically the same view. It's Atlantic uh, near the corner of uh, Lincoln Street, looking west. Uh, here's Tullahoma around sometime in the 1930s. Um, the Hotel King. Uh, downtown at the railroad station, Cascade Falls, way back in 1905. Uh, I don't know when this aerial view of Camp Forest was taken, probably the 40s, I'm guessing, maybe maybe 50s. Uh, and there's uh, gate number one uh, at the camp as well. All right, with that done, I'm going to turn it over to Keith, and he's going to talk about natural features, uh, at least as a starting point. Thanks, Bill. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, while I can't claim to have been born and raised like my colleague Liesl over here in Tullahoma, um, my grandfather was stationed at Camp Forest. Uh, he met what would become my grandmother. My mother was born here at Camp Forest, so I do have some ties. Um, but I've only been here a couple of times, and um, so I'm just starting to get my head wrapped around your community. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the um, physical conditions, um, just initial observations. And this is really, um, like, like Phil said, this is, this is very top level, but this just gives you an idea of some of the things that we'll start to look uh, at in, in more detail. So first, from a, a natural feature standpoint, uh, you know, looking at topography, you know, the, the, the role of the land, you know, you're at the edge of the Highland Rim. Uh, and, you know, you have some fairly gentle slopes in the historic kind of core of the city. Of course, it then sort of drops down, as everyone knows, uh, towards Rock Creek. Uh, but seems like your more steeper slopes are up in the north um, um, uh, eastern portion uh, of the county, uh, excuse me, of the city. And, um, and that certainly, uh, topography certainly plays a role in how a, a community grows uh, over time. From a water standpoint, I mean, obviously, you have Rock Creek that flows generally along the, uh, the same line as the railroad and, and Jackson, um, but you've also got some great water bodies like Lake Tullahoma, Avoca Lake, uh, and then um, um, uh, each of those uh, areas, or at least the streams primarily, uh, are definitely 
um, uh, have some floodplains and, and uh, flood hazard areas associated with them. So on this map, we're starting to take a look at what those areas uh, mean. You also have some wetlands, but those are mostly uh, associated with those streams and everything. So you don't, it's not a, a, a huge widespread issue, um, but there's some definitely some wetlands uh, to, to, um, to consider uh, as you, as you um, look at your future growth. Um, soils are another thing that we'll want to look at. Now, there are a lot of characteristics of soils, so I'm not going to bore you with all of that right now, and I'm not a soil engineer, so I'm just, again, just scratching the surface here. But I did want to show a map of, of some of the drainage um, uh, characteristics of your soils because that, again, also impacts development, both existing development and, you know, as you uh, grow as a community, it could certainly affect that. The majority of your soils are uh, what they call moderately well-drained, which is a really good thing. Now, up here in um, um, this, uh, 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 the steeper part of the area, uh, the soils are more, what they call kind of excessively drained, so that means that, that water runs off uh, pretty much very quickly. Uh, and then your, your um, poorly drained soils are really where you would kind of expect them in, along your creeks and everything like that. So it's just another thing that um, we want to look at. And then the last uh, natural feature uh, is we're lucky that in, in the, uh, the uh, mapping data that you all have, you have uh, tree canopy. So um, with this, and that's what you see in the green here, obviously in the more developed areas you don't have huge clumps of trees, but in a lot of the edges, you know, around the boundary, you have a lot of areas that, that have, that are forested. Um, and, and some of that might be timberland, but uh, it's a good thing that you have a, a good tree canopy, uh, uh, at least at the edges here. Now, switching into the more built environment or the sort of man-made sort of uh, um, characteristics, um, we're gonna be looking at your existing land uses. Um, now, the, the mapping data that we have has all of the classifications for that. I'm going to work with uh, Mary to, to kind of match that up with her information, make sure that we're looking right. But you can see that there's a number of categories here. Uh, just a few things to point out about this. Again, these are things that are probably inherent to you, things that you know, but I'm learning. Um, you know, your, your uh, uh, commercial is really concentrated in the downtown and certainly along North Jackson and uh, East Carroll a bit. But really, Jackson is obviously your um, uh, major commercial core and we got to see a lot of that uh, today uh, on our tour. Um, uh, the residential is, is um, uh, interesting, but not necessarily um, different from a lot of communities that we see, uh, particularly the ones that uh, have developed uh, um, um, more outside of their core uh, in um, uh, later years, uh, particularly uh, after the advent of the automobile. Your multifamily is mostly beyond the historic core, um, so, uh, and it's in larger kind of developments, okay? So it's more like apartment complexes. What you don't have as much of is the, you know, the smaller scale multifamily that a lot of historic uh, communities uh, often uh, have. Um, but as you can imagine, you're predominantly single family in this. Now, there's a, a broad range of, of, of single-family um, uh, characteristics in terms of lot size and, and houses and so forth, but um, uh, the majority of the area is single-family. And then at your edges is where you still have some of that rural residential. So you really kind of have across the full spectrum in this city. You're not, you know, completely built out. Which is, um, which is a good thing. Uh, other uses, obviously the airport is a major important use uh, for the air. The uh, Short Springs natural area um, uh, is an important area and Arnold Air Force Base, which is obviously more in the county, but is certainly a big part of that. This little gap that you're seeing down here is the portion of your community that's actually in uh, Franklin County. And so we're st we don't quite have the same level of information from, from them as we do from Coffee County. So that's why that's showing blank. It's not that there's nothing there. Uh, it's mostly residential anyway. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Liesl. Thanks, Keith. I think the last time I was on the stage with a microphone, I was president of the Interact Club <laughs> back in 2004. So um, I'm going to touch on uh, mobility, which is an important issue for many communities. So this is both motorized and non-motorized traffic. 
one of the major things that we look at when we first look at a community are their commuting patterns. And so the census provides a great data set, data set excuse me, that is available online. It's the LEHD data. And basically what it does is it takes uh, residences and places of work and it looks at the census blocks um, and kind of where are people going from their home to their work and then vice versa. So here in Tullahoma, we have roughly 11,000, 12,000 folks that are employed um, here in Tullahoma. Um, say about 9,000 of those are, live outside of the city limits and are commuting into the town. And again, this is just the city limits, so they may just be coming from, you know, in the urban growth boundary, for example, or they may be coming from many miles away. And there on the bottom, if you can see those little radial charts, um, those are kind of showing you the commuting patterns of the folks that are coming in on the left. So you have a lot of folks that are coming in from the north, northeast, and northwest. And then we have about 5,600 or so residents um, that are commuting out of the city limits, um, whether that be to AEDC or further. I was a little surprised to see, um, it looks like maybe some folks are commuting up to the national metropolitan area in, in that bottom uh, right side, the radial chart, you can kind of see where one, one of those legs is sticking way out um, and that's kind of denoting that folks are traveling a good, good distance to their work. All right, and so another important component of the transportation network is functional classification. And that's basically how the roadway system is classified. Um, that impacts the design of roadways, um, such as um, how wide your travel lanes, what are the speed limits. Um, it also signals to us to look at how far are the signals, are they apart? Sometimes if your signals are too close, um, they don't functionally operate as they should. So those are the types of things that we look at when we look at the functional classification of, this, of the roadway network. Total, there's about 180 miles worth of roadway in the city limits. 70% of those are local streets, so subdivisions and, and kind of uh, providing access from local properties um, to your kind of more uh, bigger roadways, I guess I should say, which are highlighted in green on the map. Um, Cedar Lane is a good example of a collector roadway. And then finally, 16% of, of that mileage are arterials. Um, largely through 41A and State Route 55. Um, in terms of the traffic volumes, TDOT has traffic counters that monitors annual traffic volumes um, on about 60 miles of these roadways here in Tullahoma. Um, so it goes back all the way into the 80s in terms of the traffic volume, so we can see how the volumes have fluctuated over the past. Um, we also have access to TDOT's statewide travel demand model, which predicts future traffic volumes, um, projects them into 2040, so we can kind of see um, where we are shaken out in that. And of course, the heavy hitters on the existing traffic volumes are probably no surprise to you all, um, with the largest volumes on North Jackson, particularly over by the Kroger, the commercial area. East Carroll Street, um, Cedar Lane was definitely one of the, the heaviest uh, tra heavily traveled collector roadways with about 10,000 vehicles per day. And then next was Wilson Avenue. Okay, and we also took a look at crashes at a high level, which we'll be digging into. This is also through a TDOT yes. database. Um, these are reported crashes, I, I should say. There are about 2,800 in the past five years, nine five fatalities with roughly 50 incapacitating injury crashes. We're also particularly interested in um, those vehicle crashes with bikes and pedestrians. And there were about 34 of those crashes over the past five years. And the map there shows you some of those locations, which a handful um, certainly are, are clustered around the arterials in the, in the commercial area, but there are certainly also crashes occurring in the subdivisions and in some of the residential areas. We also learned from the data um, that about 70% of those 2,800 2800 crashes are occurring a longer roadway segment, while about 30% are occurring at intersections. The most dominant type of crashes um, in Tullahoma are, in no particular order, uh, rear end crashes, um, no collision with vehicles, so that could be a curb or a tree or a ditch, and then of course angle crashes as well. <coughs> All right, last but not least, bikes and pedestrians. Um, just from living here, I do know that it, uh, Tullahoma is an active cycling community. Um, we do have the Highland Rim Bike Club that cycles recreationally, but there certainly are a lot of folks walking and biking. I know I worked over at the, Cup, the Celtic Cup for several years, 
and I always saw bicyclists um, coming to access a local convenience store. So it's not just for recreation. So according to the TDOT, um, to their database, which we have access to the roadway network, um, tells us all sorts of things, such as how wide the road is, um, but it also gives us information on sidewalks. So there's roughly 35 plus or minus miles of roadway with a sidewalk at this time. There are currently two state bicycle routes um, that pass through Tullahoma. Um, one of them provides north-south connectivity between Kentucky and Alabama. The other is more of an east-west type directional bicycle state route. Um, and then we also have additional data sets that provide us information on where people might be walking and biking. Strava is um, it, it's an app that people can download and they can track their, their walking trips or their cycling trips. So basically what you see there um, where it's white is telling you that there's a lot of folks who are recording their runs or rides in that area. So this is also a data set that we take a look at and kind of see where are folks um, currently walking and biking. All right, and then the last portion of um, our role is the utilities. Utilities certainly drives development. Um, so we'll be looking at the sewer, um, water plans, and specifically for the sewer, it was a very large map, so I'm kind of just transcribing what we saw on it, but most of the acreage in the city limits is serviced by city sewer. However, there are currently 11 undeveloped areas without sewer, which are largely on the edges of the city limits. There are also um, some smaller pockets of about 16 pockets that have developed um, that are currently on septic without sewer. And then finally, as a last note on the internet, um, Tullahoma is one of the smaller communities in the state to uh, progressively become a gig city. And basically um, what that means is, is ensuring that there's good broadband access, internet access um, for residents. And so that the map there is just showing you some of the areas in the red that may not have um, as fast of internet speeds or have a provider that offers it for the residents. Um, and again, these types of things um, help us to understand where the areas might develop and or not develop. All right, turn it over to Randy. And uh, I wanna welcome you all tonight. You've done a great job coming uh, tonight. And I especially wanna welcome, I don't know if she's still here, but the youngest planner in the room, did she go out? I think she was an infant about this big. Um, so if she's not in here, please give her all the information so she can continue to plan as we go through this process. But um, that's great to see her here. Um, I'm Randy Gross. I'm the economic and strategic planning consultant that is part of the team. And so part of my job is to really look at what your existing economic conditions are, sort of like the doctor looking at yourself and making sure you're okay and seeing what's wrong. Maybe we can help that sort of thing as part of the planning process but also looking at what your potentials are in terms of economic development, in terms of housing, and resolving certain challenges with housing, the, those types of questions. And also I'm gonna be looking at some of the lodging types of questions and tourism questions as well as part of this. But I'll be interested in hearing from you what other economic and strategic planning questions you might have tonight. Just starting to look at the very beginning here, your economic base, what you have, what you don't have, that sort of thing. As Liesl said, you have about 12,000 jobs within the city of Tullahoma. Very diverse mix of jobs, as you can see from that chart. There's not one particular type of industry that dominates um, your, your economy. Um, healthcare is very big, with about 15% of the jobs. That's the golden area there on the side. Retail, professional and technical types of services related somewhat to the base and contracting for the base manufacturing and accommodation services or tourism. Those are some of your larger sectors, but there's not one in particular that dominates within the city. Some of your major employers, and in, in, in addition to Arnold uh, Engineering, are the T&E Connectivity, Cubic Transportation Systems. We saw some of these today. In fact, we drove by JSP, uh, Wisco and Envelope Corporation, and some others. So you know some of those companies very well. Just to talk a little bit about Arnold and its impact, um, I, I did read the impact analysis that's done annually or semi-annually for, uh, for the base. Obviously, you have a significant aerospace ground testing there. It's the world's largest complex of ground test, uh, test facilities, not text, but testing facilities. So that's very important 
uh, not only at a local level and a regional level, but internationally. So that's a very important thing to keep in mind, a real asset for the community. Um, according to the base, you have about a $680 million impact, economic impact on the area economy as of 2020. Um, there are about 1,700 employees, including about 1,300 who are private contractors. So most of the employees associated with the base, as you probably already know, are private contractors, not government employees. There are also about 1,100 or 1,200 secondary jobs, which means those types of jobs that are attributed to the base that are not directly related to the base itself. So other types of businesses spin off in the local economy. And then you have other types of aerospace strengths here in the region um, and in the city, including your local airport, which is wonderful. We saw the new terminal today, um, the UT Space Institute, the Beechcraft Museum, a lot of different elements that relate in one way or another to aerospace that are very important to your local economy. Just looking at some of the employment trends, um, now since 2002, within the city, you've lost about 2,500 jobs. And of those, about 1,400 were in manufacturing. Now this is not completely unusual, because in the United States as a whole, we've lost a lot of manufacturing jobs over the past 20 years or so, for a variety of reasons. But what's a little disturbing is that the city's share of your micropolitan area, you're actually part of a micropolitan or a metropolitan, a small metropolitan area, is actually declining. So in 2002, you had about 40% of the jobs in the Tullahoma, Manchester micropolitan area. Then by 2010, you had 35%, and by 2018, 29%. Uh, so you've had a declining share of the regional economy, um, which is a, a little bit more disturbing. Unemployment, as you probably are not surprised about, peaked during the pandemic last year, as it did internationally, globally, but has subsided and is now down to about 4.2% um, as of the most recent figures last month. Uh, just some more information about some of the trends in your economy. You've seen growth. These blue bars here are showing some of the growth in certain sectors. So you've had tremendous growth in what are called management services. Those are corporate types of jobs or management service types of jobs. So you're doing very well in Tullahoma on that. In fact, you've had about 140% increase, uh, I believe that since 2002. Government, tourism, healthcare, administrative services, those are all some of the sectors that are growing. On the other hand, as I said before, you've lost manufacturing jobs, You've lost some professional technical jobs, about 25%, and some retail jobs. So you can see there's not even growth in all of the industries. Uh, just some demographic information. You've had some modest population and household growth, which is good. Um, within the city, you gained about 7% in population since 2010. So your population as of 2019 was just a hair under 20,000. Maybe when we see the new census figures, you might be above 20,000 in population. The Tullahoma Manchester Micropolitan Statistical Area had about 105,000 people, and that's growth of about 5.6%. And in terms of something like income, the income within the city has actually increased by about 25% since 2010. Now, remember 2009, 2010, uh, yeah, 2008, 2009, we had a global recession. So incomes had dropped significantly during that time. So since then, we've seen a gradual increase, about 25% in incomes, uh, up until about 2019, which is the latest data that I had available. And with the micropolitan area, about the same amount. So incomes are increasing, even as the job base sort of declined there for a while. Um, just to talk a little bit more about commutation, not to repeat what Liesl had said before, but just to give a little bit more information of specifically where people are coming from that are working in Tullahoma. About 80% of the workers, as we know, are commuting from outside of the city. And they're coming from other areas around here, Franklin County, Moore County, Bedford, and Coffee Counties, but different areas to the northeast, northwest, and southeast. About 69% of Tullahoma residents commute out of the city for work. So almost seven out of 10 of you are commuting out of the city for work, and mainly to Manchester, Shelbyville, Nashville, Winchester, Murfreesboro, and Smyrna. So you are correct, Lisa, when you said some people are commuting to Nashville. I think it's in the top six places where people are commuting from Tullahoma. 
On the housing side, and this is an area where I'll be focusing as part of the comprehensive plan, you have about 8,800 housing units. Since 2014, though, only about 125 units have been built, according to the Census Bureau. So not a huge number of housing has been added in the past, say, seven years, six or seven years. About 87% of your housing is single family, which is up by 10%, and about 13% is in apartments and other multifamily, and that's down by 8%. So you've had a decrease in the number of multifamily apartment type units overall. In terms of tenure, about 60% of your housing is owner occupied. That's down by about 9%, whereas renter households are up uh, by 16%. So what's weird about that is you've had a decrease in the number of apartments and multifamily housing, but you've had an increase in the number of renters, according to the Census Bureau. So what does that mean? That means renters are more likely going into single family houses now than they would have been 10 years ago. I don't know if that jives with what you see on the ground, but more single family housing is being used as rental units, according to the Census Bureau. Vacancy is significantly down for owner-occupied units, only 0.5% vacancy um, in, in owner-occupied units, down from about 3.6% in 2010. Renter vacancy is up a little bit to 9.6%. It was 5.5%. And then in terms of the median rents and values, home values, they've both been going up. Uh, rents are about $760 on, uh, in terms of a median rent. Um, that's up 25% since 2010, and the median value of a home was about 150000 which is up 21%. And some of that information comes from Redfin. Here's some information here showing the average number of sales per month, about 40 sales per month according to Redfin. Um, and then in terms of the average days on the market, you can see it sort of averaged around 40 days, but in the last couple of years, it's houses have been moving much quicker on the market. And similarly with prices, you can see there's been a dramatic increase in the last few years in terms of the median price. Um, in terms of houses on the market now, about $235,000 would be the median. Not the value, but the median sale price of houses on the market, about $235,000. So that gives you a little bit of background information based on what I've been able to find so far. Just starting the process, but we want to hear from you as well as we move forward and look forward to working with you. I really wasn't sleeping back there. I'm just observing. Just a few more slides on initial observations, and then, then we'll have a, a conversation. You know, I mentioned before that we're going to be looking at past plans that, that have been done and studies and so forth. And these are just some of the key ones, particularly the more recent ones, like the community mobility plan that was done here in, in Manchester in 2019. There was the North Jackson Street uh, Streetscape Initiative, which you may be familiar with that, that same year. Uh, the year before that, the National Main Street Assessment occurred because the city's looking at a Main Street program to revitalize downtown, and so that was done in 2018. There was a, the broadband, a downtown broadband uh, plan was done in 2016. And then the, the most recent comprehensive plan, like what we're going to update now, was done back in 2011. And by the way, you know, for states that mandate uh, comprehensive planning, uh, usually it's like every five years. So y'all are well, well due for another comprehensive plan. The, um, when you look at your zoning, you know, one thing I was, I was kind of surprised because you have a relatively few number of zoning districts because, I mean, for example, we're working in similarly the sized communities right now that might have three times as many zoning districts, which might be too many, but, um, you know, you've only got like two commercial districts and the C1 uh, that color there, that's mainly around the downtown. C2 is more of like a kind of a commercial highway uh, zoning. You've got two different um, industrial zones. You've got four different um, residential, the most common being the R1, which is the lowest density. I think those are like 12,000 square foot lots, if I recall. And then you've got uh, agricultural, like over here and here, and then open space one, uh, which is here. So we're gonna kind of dig into all that. Obviously, you've also got this airport overlay. If you can barely see those kind of rings around the airport, that particularly look at things like building heights. 
And then the other thing, we, we didn't get the data in time for tonight, but we, we have it now. The ur urban growth boundary, you know, some years ago when the state passed a law that communities needed to determine a boundary for future growth. So there is a, a boundary we've got, and we'll take a look at that. We'll revisit that. Does it make sense to keep the current boundaries or, or should that be adjusted somehow? Um, and when it comes to historic districts, you know, first of all, there's two different types of historic districts. When you say historic district, people oftentimes think you're talking about a national register district, which you've got. You've actually got four different national register districts, which aren't mapped here. These are local, and I'll talk about that in a second. But the, you know, you've got four different national register. The thing about national register, it's it's a federal designation. It's primarily honorary, except it does come with the uh, at least a qualified project can take advantage of the investment tax credit for historic rehabilitation. So it doesn't come with any protections for properties, but it does come with financial incentives. The only way to really protect properties is with local historic districts, or what some people call historic uh, zoning, which you don't have. You've got it on the books, but it's never been formally adopted as far as districts. Now, these were uh, some districts that were proposed some years ago when, when the city was contemplating doing historic zoning, so I'm just showing those for that purpose. And that is something we'll look at. Um, it might make total sense to have historic zoning at a local level, but um, usually that's something that's driven very much by the preference of, of affected property owners, and you really need to have a strong consensus of people on board before you, you go into that, uh, you know, that, that uh, type of approach. So, but it is something we're gonna look at pretty closely. Uh, and then finally, looking at just some of the key entities, you know, I'm talking about public policy, but what are some of the, the organizations that are involved with that? Obviously, there's a city. We've just kind of bullet pointed some of the key uh, bodies. There are a lot of different uh, city departments, such as planning and zoning, that are real relevant to what we'll be doing. Coffee County, of course, the most probably the most relevant uh, department they've got would be the highway department, part of their public works. You've got regional agencies like the South Central Tennessee Development District and the Appala Appalachian Regional Commission. Um, others include the Chamber of Commerce, the Arnold Engineering Development Complex, UT Space Institute, and Motlow State. Um, and I mentioned before about among the plans that were done, 2018 they did that Main Street assessment. That's something, hopefully you'll have a Main Street entity as, as yet another important organization. Okay, so with all that kind of background stuff, and as Randy mentioned too, you know, we're gonna be digging a lot deeper on all these topics uh, as we get further into the project. But in the meantime, we wanna start off just kind of getting your initial thoughts. And what I wanna ask you is, what do you think the biggest challenges are or the biggest opportunities are for Tullahoma right now and, and into the future? What do you think the big challenges are or the opportunities? Thanks, Winston. Oh, I'm sorry, where did that come from? Oh, okay. So the biggest uh, uh, challenge maybe is land use and development. Okay. Is there a particular aspect of that? Well, I have a map here if I can show it right quick. Okay. Um, former Mayor Lane Curley wanted that his initiative was to have 90% of the land that he within a half mile of recreational opportunities. Uh -huh. I'm just let you hold this and you can give it to me. Well, we did a map um, that showed, I don't know if you can show it back there, but this buffer is the half mile of recreational facilities here in Fort Springs. And all the, we took the addresses within residential and then made a buffer of the recreational. And everybody within this circle is within a half mile of recreation. The others are not. So right now we have, I have it upside down. <laughs> so right now we have 52 percent are within this buffer. This was several years ago, but as you can see, if I hold it correctly, there's an awful lot. We're talking about the top poverty, but there's an awful lot of open space that most likely will be developed at some point. And I'd like to see possibly an incentive for developers to uh, add percentage of that land as green space or park or and it's also an opportunity to plant trees in that area that won't um, endanger the houses the tree board on the tree board and we're all for collecting trees um, yes 
Well, that's thank. My, that's my opinion. Great, thank you. That's a great opinion. And by the way, one thing I don't think I mentioned this. Um, we're going to be preparing before we get into the before we do the charrette. We're going to prepare a set of planning principles, and these are kind of general, broad principles that we want to see people buy into because they're the basis of the plan. And you know, usually among the principles, there's something about open space and parks and recreation and so forth. So that's a perfect example. Say, and we've done other plans where you said, you know, everyone should be within a half mile walk of a park or a small commercial center in a neighborhood or something to that effect. So I love that idea. I appreciate you sharing that with us because that's something that we could maybe work into those principles. Great. Yes, ma'am. I have a question about one piece of, uh, of data that was up there. The poverty level was a little over 18 percent. Yes. Uh, how does that compare with other cities of our size? Yeah, so, and the question is that the poverty level was a little over 18 percent. How does that compare with uh, other communities this size? Um, well, we're, I'm working in one other community about this size, and it's much lower than that community, but they're all across the board. It really depends. I think you're about average. You're not a particularly above average in terms of poverty levels. The state of Tennessee, I'm not sure. It's still not sure. You don't know that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but you're, you're about average from what I've seen about communities your size. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. everybody didn't hear there were kind of two ideas one is how could Tullahoma become kind of a, a center for the region and draw people you know tourists going to Lynchburg things like that and the fact that right now you don't have a central sort of gathering place uh, like a lot of communities have a, a town green or a courthouse square or something to that effect for special events and, and so forth and uh, it's funny the mayor and I were actually talking about it earlier today and I think that's something that we need to do I mean this plan needs to address that and identify at least one, if not multiple, you know, alternative locations for that kind of, we've worked on projects in other communities where we created those kind of places as part of the plan. They were developed and then they become iconic. You know, that's the spot, that's what, and it's oftentimes kind of an economic anchor for the community and starts to turn the downtown around. So I think it's really important that we, we do something like that. So great comments, thank you. Yes, sir. One, uh, one challenge would be to make uh, Tullahoma a bicycle-friendly community. Uh, there are several of the main, the main thoroughfares are definitely not bicycle-friendly, they're not pedestrian-friendly. And I do see people trying to navigate uh, Jackson and, uh, and Wilson 
and uh, see the lane on bicycles and, and walking where the sidewalks are not dangerous uh, and there's no, uh, there's no shoulders. Right, so really we need to look at both being more bike friendly and just pedestrian friendly in general. Yeah, and it's even more than that. They're, they're totally inaccessible. So unless you have a car, you can't access those parts of the city. Um, there's, there's no walking at all. Yeah, so you're really wedded to a vehicle, <laughs> a motorized vehicle. Right. Yes, ma'am. I think to that, in that same conversation is viewing it from the standpoint of day and night, um, understanding that there's a large percentage of the population that, um, you know, there's activity that happens after dark in Tullahoma. And, and when you say about activity after dark, um, like downtown primarily? Whether it be from, uh, I think we have an increasing number of events in the area, as well as people who do walk to and from work at different hours. Um, but at the Chamber of Commerce, we see a consistent network of people just walking to and from for various reasons, and I don't believe that stops because the sun goes down. Right, yeah, so, so don't just think in terms of being pedestrian friendly when, when the sun's up. Yes, ma'am. Speaking about uh, being friendly and a place to walk and so forth, I um, I guess my concern is not to change anything, but to reinforce some of the traffic laws that we have, such as the speed limit on Wilson Avenue. Um, it is 45 miles an hour. I live on Wilson Avenue. And I know that there's nothing friendly about the track and the speed that goes up and down that road. And I think until you um, make a city so attractive that people want to slow down, now trucks may never, but I travel a lot. And when I go to a small town that's attractive, I enjoy looking at the residential area. And Quite honestly, um, the accidents that we have had in our yard, it's scary. We had the last one just about a week ago. And it's because of, of so much traffic and it's going too fast. So I'm just asking for laws to be enforced. Right, and as far as this plan, if, um, you know, the idea, how do you calm traffic? How do you slow it down? And I mean, we could look at things like speed limits, but the other part of this that's really important is there are a lot of traffic calming techniques that Lisa could talk about all day, but they are ways, you know, the way a, pe people drive is mainly on the perceived level of safety. It's, they don't even look at, at signs usually what the speed limit is. It's about the design of the street. When you got a really wide street and you don't have street trees along it, and there's not that close frame of reference, you tend to drive a lot faster. When you have things like a narrower driving lane, maybe sidewalks, maybe street trees, you naturally drive slower. Just like people drive faster when they're on a one-way street, right? Uh, versus two-way. So, so we can look at posted speed limits, but we can also look at the design of the roads and figure out some traffic calming. So very good point, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, the infrastructure, is going to be the most important thing. If you don't have good infrastructure, highways, uh, walks, uh, how are you going to serve the community if you don't have those? In the community, we need, you know, we need to bypass probably at some point in the future uh, because of the, the lot of traffic that we have. Uh, somebody mentioned sidewalks. We don't have enough sidewalks for pedestrians. And if we're going to expand and grow, how about the the utilities and the water and even uh, roads. So I think the infrastructure is going to be a huge, huge problem, you know, drainage. Yes. Um, we have a lot of flooding and stuff, but we have a lot of severe, and the drainage needs to be addressed. I mean, there's multitudes of, of problems that we have. Yeah, so bottom line, infrastructure, stormwater drainage, roads, uh, all, all that stuff. One thing I would uh, point out on, on the idea of a bypass, we can certainly look at that. Bypasses can have unintended consequences. You have to be careful about them, right? I mean, we've all seen communities that had a bypass that routed traffic around the community and it hurt it economically. So I'm not saying we can't look at alternatives to help traffic, but that's just one kind of cautionary thought. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. 
Um, so I'm going to probably sound a bit confusing um, when I describe what I think about from a young female perspective because I have three kiddos. Um, but when the gentleman talked about a bike path, when we lived in Oklahoma, my husband and I, they would lay Hefner on this 10 mile loop. And what I love about it is no cars could get on that. I mean, it was only two entryways. And you could be out there and you could just really relax and let your guard down and enjoy that. And so what I thought about is when Ever someone talks about having an area where we could commonly gather or have an event or in my head I think like hipster, a couple food trucks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I often think about if you've got young kiddos, the ideal spot for me would be that the parking is now somehow along this, you know, kind of like a U-shaped form. And so that everything interior, once I get in there and there's, oh, there's a playground over here so I can have that kid playing, oh, my three, two teenagers over here, you know, this food truck. I just like the idea that you can finally truly relax. And that might be the biggest difference I feel compared to downtown, is that really unless the downtown square somehow really capitalized on that aspect of parking and routing and traffic, you know, we don't have a square. I came from Columbia and it had a cute little square and I love what they've done there. But um, without that, without that really like secure feeling, I feel like it's hard to enjoy some of what that offering is. So, I kind of think of more of a space where you carve that out and have all that into <coughs> Right. So in other words, let's, let's look to design a space that's kid-friendly and safe. And, you know, when you look at public spaces in the community, you you need different types. That's really important. I mean, sure, it might be great to have a public space downtown, but maybe you need a larger park for other things like what you just described. So typically you want a series of different types of parks, open spaces for different types of activities. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Well, I just wanted to mention that we are very fortunate to have South Jackson City Center, which was our original square. You look back all the So we are trying very much to make that a kid-friendly, adult-friendly come in, and, there's all, and it is actually city property. So I think that is something that we need to you know, it's always, we seem to come up with ideas, but just like a lot of our aldermen have been working this past year, we build the playground, but do we keep up the playground? So we have to think about what we can do, but then we have to keep it up, and we have to keep, you know. So I just had to bring up South Jackson, since I don't think Brett is here. Okay, so using South Jackson as an example, the bottom line is if you're going to have these public spaces, you got to maintain them well, too, correct? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, my driving teenage granddaughter complains all the time that there's no place for them to gather. Uh, they go gather in one place and they get off. Yeah. They find another place and they get off. They're not causing any property because you don't have a place to go. Yeah, well, uh, so the, your granddaughter, you said? Uh, doesn't have a place to go, uh, they drive somewhere and then they get run off. What about downtown? Is that a possibility or not right now? Just throwing that out. <laughs> no, I'm seeing a lot of heads. Not no way! Not for teenagers. Okay. <laughs> so. Okay, yeah, I guess so. Yes, sir. Um, green space, recreational space, whatever you want to call it, is obviously a significant asset, but a very major draw to any any place, big and small, doesn't really matter. I've had lived here for about four years. But the biggest issue with green space here is that there's no public space because it's all private space. So how do you propose creating public space out of private space without taking private property? So I mean I'm not disagreeing with it, I think it's correct, but we've always looked around and said there is no down there's a downtown, but it's not usable in a in a square kind of sense. It's, there's no city park. There's nothing like that because it's all privately owned property. Yeah. So you've got a real issue trying to create all this which we would all love to have without eminent domain making an awful lot of people off of it. Yeah, so the whole issue there is you know, how do you create public green space, public parks, when it's privately owned now? unless you condemn it, right? Um, but we see communities do it all the time. Now, I don't mean condemn it. Typically, and I don't know if you all want to chime in, but a lot of times it's just a friendly sale that occurs. I mean, in other words, the city offers market value price and the people are willing to sell 
and uh, and maybe it's even above market price in some cases, right? And uh, yeah, which is what they're doing in Shelbyville. Oh, that's what they're doing in Shelbyville right now. Yes, yeah, so so you don't always have to use condemnation to, to create public space. Usually, it, it, it's just purchased. Yeah. Yes, sir. It was just like, I would definitely like to see like vibrant downtown developed um, in my thirty something years of living here. Um, it's been uh, Telehome has been very linearly developed. It's the city designed to get you through it, um, and you're not going to stay around and play. Um, you had an excellent kind of quote in your proposal um, about the kind of a, I, I don't remember it at all, and I'm not even going to attempt to paraphrase it, but something about basically developing first impressions uh, on the downtown itself, um, and, I, and that kind of resonated with me. I noted that. Um, Anyway, um, I'm looking forward to what you guys have to do and, and, and hope to participate uh, along well. So thanks. All right, thank you. And, and you know, his comment was uh, you know about the importance of a downtown and and you know people really do judge a community by its downtown. I mean, think about when you go out to a strip commercial highway, um, it's it's franchise architecture, right? It's you know some people call it generica because whether it's Tullahoma or Peoria, it kind of looks the same, right? But the place where you have your identity is your downtown. That's the unique uh, uh, place. And, and people go to a downtown and they judge the community as a whole on the, on the downtown. It's just kind of a natural instinct. So yeah, I mean, we put a big emphasis on your downtown. We think it's gonna be really important for the overall community. Yes, ma'am. I know there's already been a lot of conversation about places to gather. But speaking from a business standpoint, I'm with the Chamber of Commerce event space. We don't really have event space here, especially seated for 200 to 300. So yeah. there is a challenge uh, with when you want to host events, but there's really nowhere to happen. Right, and, and uh, you know the point being that if, if we create a downtown space, it needs to be able to accommodate pretty substantial events. Yeah, I totally, totally agree with that. Yes, ma'am. Um, you mentioned uh, a couple of places, the um, Short Springs Natural Area, and that is a pretty um, highly trafficked area. It's got a lot of publicity outside of the Tullahoma area. It's got a very small parking area, um, and if you go and take a look, and it's almost always full, and you look at the license plates, and they're from all over, not just Tennessee, from, from everywhere. So it's really difficult for people in Tullahoma to actually go and use that. And there's also, there's no picnic area, there's no adjacent park space um, <coughs> that would really, I think, enhance that Short Springs area. Um, you know, so you've got the, the, the foundation of Short Springs, but I think there's a real opportunity to look how do you enhance that area and make it more friendly, um, you know, for more park space for the Tullahoma community. Right, so, you know, what can we do to improve parking and other things to leverage that great resource more? You know, when you think about tourism, one analogy I've always heard is, it's like uh, pinball. Does anybody remember pinball? Anybody remember? <laughs> so, so, you know, think of the tourists as a ball, and you want to keep hitting them with buzzers, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, the flippers, and every time they buzz, they're spending money. You want to keep them on the board as long as you can. And, and that's what you do with tourists. You know, so you, you want a package of things to keep them there longer. Maybe they'll spend the night, have some meals, and there's a much greater economic impact. And that's the perfect kind of, you know, resource that needs to be maximized so we can keep hitting them with more flippers. <laughs> I have the pressure that I want to put on the rush curriculum. Uh, in the city itself. Uh, what's, what's of interest to me is it's selfish, 100%. Uh, the model state wants to be connected uh, via bike path, via walkway. I don't care if you jog it. I don't care if you get an e-bike and ride it. Uh, but I'd love to see that green space, if that becomes a part of the plan, actualized, then we're connected on this north side. And we're working on the other way to get connected to the uh, That roundabout loop, safety and security and the thing i think everybody in this room wants to have uh, i want to see this dude in 20 years <laughs> um, and i want to see winifred in 20 years they might not come to my but i want to be able to walk ride job uh, to be connected and i think that is also part of when we think about a community college and its relationship with its township and its membership its community 
uh, is really affixed and tied to parts of the economic community about the value. So it must be a destination. Yeah, a lot of great stuff packed into what you just said, and Motlow State is a tremendous resource, clearly, for this community. Yes, sir. Now, um, to continue with connection on Motlow State and expanding our Greenway, back when, 10, 15 years ago, when I lived in North Carolina, they had a huge statewide Greenway project where they built Greenways in every city and then slowly connected them all together. So you could essentially get from one side of North Carolina to the other by just walking and creating a giant walking biking path. And that is probably way too big for what this meeting is about, but it would be nice to see just kind of plans to have the Greenway expand through the city and potentially have the ability to connect up to Shelbyville, Lynchburg, or something around those lines. Yeah, I mean, that's a great idea. We're definitely going to be look at ha looking at how you could expand your existing Greenway system, and we'll certainly look at the neighboring communities and how, you know, connections might be made. So, very good. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, and maybe this is out of the scope, but I think certainly part of this overall plan is, is for some kind of growth. I think that one thing that we, we need to address on this plan has to take into account. We mentioned that uh, 5,600 residents for out of the city. One thing that we have seen over the years is that our young people that leave here don't return. And so as we look at, at making town more better and looking at in the future, I think that the, the economical growth that comes from commerce, industrial growth, uh, are just really um, the stress that we already have which are, are in aerospace, some technology, healthcare. And the plan has to be, part of the plan has to be to really look at what we do to bring people back to work in Tahoma and those the young people that, that leave and then come back here. So it should be, should be built in a city replenishes that say. Yeah, great comment. You know, how do you create opportunities, job opportunities, so that young people don't have to move away, or at least if they move away for a while, maybe for college, right. they'll come back. And that's something Randy's going to look at a lot. I mean, one of his two big focuses, well, one is housing, but the other one's economic development, as in job creation and so forth. So very good, very good point. Yes, ma'am. Okay. JT. Yes. We're just, in an example of what we're doing, we're just won't go away. <laughs> okay. okay, so we chose to we chose to stay here and the word home is in the word Tahoma. And I hope people will think about that and and, and um thus we have Liesl here, thank goodness. But but anyway and also um not to offend anyone but uh, it was brought out a minute ago that we didn't have a town square. Yes we do, we just don't have a courthouse in the middle of it. Okay? And also um I think education of your employees is very important and that really doesn't have anything to do with building and infrastructure at all, but several years ago uh, I saw someone that was in a, one of our parks, a small park, our caboose park, and I walked over and, to talk to them from our business and they had stayed in one of our local hotels here and uh, they were from New Orleans and they were on their way to Nashville but they had taken the southern route to try to, to see something different. and. Um, and I asked them, I said, well, um, how did you find Tahoma? And they said, well, it's the one and only, so they wanted to come here. And, but they had asked, they had asked it, uh, where they were staying, what is there to do in Tahoma? And the girl at the counter said nothing. <laughs> Ooh! You know, that didn't sit well with me. Those of y'all who know me, that did not fly well. And so uh, I think education of your employees is, is very, very important, and to sell what we love and what we call home is so important so yeah that's a great point especially for employees that work in a in a dining business or retail they need to be ambassadors for your community right they need to be knowledgeable about where people can go and and again you know that's another flipper right to keep them, keep them on the the board but yeah i agree we, we need to think in those terms of, of being uh, ambassadors and salespeople for the community yes sir to kind of go along with uh, the statement down there, I think that the buzzword has 
has been destination. You know, we have to figure out if Tullahoma is going to be a destination to keep people staying here instead of going to Murfreesboro, uh, Chattanooga, Nashville. For my prior life, one of my issues that I had as we talked about trying to educate or get people to come back here to stay, I couldn't get young talent out of college to come work down here because they were young. There was nothing to do. They wanted to be up to up around Nashville. They wanted to be around Murfreesboro. So that that needs to be our focus. If we want to retain, we have to figure out how do we make this where everybody wants to come and find this as, you know, the wonderful, you know, home that we live in right now, but not everybody, nobody really knows what this is. So let's make this a destination. Let's retain our people. Let's get them to come back. Well, well said. Yes, ma'am. I want to follow up on the education aspects of Tullahoma. I think that our educational system is one of the finest Tennessee in our area, that is what we tout. We, we're very proud of that. And we like to take care of the students and the children that are growing up in our community, but we do need to provide them more places to interact healthfully and um, legally. <laughs> and um, but education is key, and young people will bring their children to Tullahoma and want to make a home here because of our educational system. And as we expand into the future for places to go and things to do, a beautiful environment to live in. Right. You know, y'all are really fortunate to have a, a great educational, public educational system here. I mean, we're working in some communities right now that have horrible public schools, and they're, they're just, you know, wringing their hands trying to figure out what to do. And they, they say exactly what you said. Education is key. It really is. to, And, and it's so connected to, to issues like, you know, economic development and housing and, and, and all sorts of things. So that's great that you have that uh, to build on. So. Yes, sir. To get back to your flipper, uh, we all as citizens, as business owners, need to know what businesses are in our town. The Chamber of Commerce does a great job, but, and don't be selfish with your customers. If they're in your store and you don't have it, you need to know you can send them down the street this way or that way because you know what's in that facility keep the money here because next time that person might be sending them to you so we all need to take it on ourselves to understand when a new business comes to town there's a ribbon cutting go and see what they have and educate yourself to where you can keep that visitor happy by knowing where to send them next the other thing is if you build a piece a building on a public road other than a subdivision put a sidewalk in front of it. And I don't care how much money you spend, you don't get to opt out, and a parking lot's not good enough. We and have places where we've got sidewalks as wide as this room in front of something that go nowhere, but yet you've got another facility with plenty of money and no sidewalk at all in front of it. That's a codes issue, that's a city issue, but you want sidewalks, force people to put them there. Yeah, that, that's a good, so two thoughts are on the sidewalks. You know, that has, it has to be in your subdivision uh, regulations. And, and in fact, I guess it, it is, it, it's, it's just more recently being in, in force. Um, but that's a great point about sidewalks. And your other thing about uh, helping to market other businesses, essentially, you know, the Main Street program, one of their main, one of their big ideas they always preach is cross marketing things like having a, uh, a storefront exhibit, you know, a, a display for your goods, but having something from another business. Maybe it's a clothing store, and there's a piece of furniture from a store down the street that you know a piece of clothing's laying on, and there's a little sign promoting the furniture store. That kind of thing, um, you know, that's the kind of thing that Main Street programs can help uh, organize. So that's something we'll look at. And we're gonna we're gonna go to the next question soon, but these people in the back corner are dying to talk. Yes, yes, ma'am. I, I noticed that you had nothing mentioned about the possibility of maybe Amtrak coming in through the call. Have y'all or any more about any of that or, okay. because uh, from my understanding there will not be a stop 
Okay, so the question is, if we looked at Amtrak, you know, this is officially our, our first day here. <laughs> and we're, we're at the very beginning of just digging into what your facts are. So we've not gotten that far, but I'm glad you brought it up because it's going right into Keith's notes. And we'll look at Amtrak as a possibility. Um, let, you know, what I'd like to do now, though, and, and these are great ideas, but just so we can kind of get through um, the, into the next question. And that is, um, you know, as I mentioned before, we're not going to try to duplicate some other community. I mean, Tullahoma is a great place, and it's unique, and it needs to stay unique. But we've all been somewhere, somewhere we live maybe, um, visited, and there may be some aspect of some other community, and you think, hey, that's, that's kind of neat. Maybe we could take that idea and adapt it to Tullahoma. So are there any ideas you might have from places you visited or lived or, or heard of? Yes, sir. West Haven, Nashville. Okay. You take a look at it. West Haven, if, for those who don't know, it's a what they call a traditional neighborhood development. In other words, it's kind of like the way we used to design communities prior to the automobile taking over, you know, pre-1940. Keith, right here, our scribe for the night, lives in West Haven. Love it. <laughs> so, loves it. Um, yeah, so that's Back a great, you know, I think, the I'm a big fan of revitalizing existing places, but there's always market demand for new development, right? And that means green fields that, that get developed. But I think traditional neighborhood development, that form is, is the best form of, of new growth. So that's so, something that we could- A lot of young people live there. And I do a lot of work in Nashville. I'm a woman traveling in Nashville. I do a lot of environmental work. So I'm the first one there to go look at land and development. So West Haven, uh, I've been in Hendersonville, I've been to Lebanon, with all the developments, even Columbia, even a small town called Watertown, who's actually you know, used, looking at using rail to offer transport into Nashville. That's actually gonna happen and transferring back and forth. You don't have to get a car and drive now. So things like that. There's, I know benchmark you may be doing with other communities like West Coast, but it'd be good to look at them and see how, what young people are looking at. Yeah, absolutely. And we got an expert right here who lives there. <laughs> Uh, what about some other places you might have been that, uh, yes, sir? Number one, my favorite spot is Peachtree City. I, mean, I love this layout when you drive through it. It's very calm and relaxing drive, but all the, uh, everything was off to the side, and I love how the developments, you know, little shopping centers kind of broken up around here. Yeah, Peachtree City, Georgia. Um, I stayed there a couple of weeks ago. I've never been. I'm working on a town center plan in Tryon, Georgia, immediately north. And, but the, the only hotel, they don't have hotels in Tryon. They don't even have a town center, that's why we're doing the plan. But Peachtree City, I stayed there, and what's kind of weird about it, I mean, a lot of people like it, is people drive around in golf carts. And I've only seen those on like coastal resorts usually. <laughs> but, uh, but it's neat, and, but, and they plan for them. They have pathways, and they accommodate them. You go to a restaurant, and you know, a third of the vehicles might be golf carts. That's right, yeah. It, it is. And I like some more control here as far as this sharing a common egress into the shop. Some of our subdivisions do that, but uh, uh, there's been some put up recently that uh, were just kind of laid out where you have individual homes right there on the main thoroughfare. And it makes kind of a danger of them, you know, backing out onto the main road. I mean, when it could have been laid out where everybody just goes in, one, one entrance, or, or multiple entrances, but a shear that's in, to, that are laid out in space properly, you know, to merge into traffic, instead of just having the uh, little short driveways coming right into the uh, uh, road, which to me doesn't make any, should have been laid out a little better. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, the, the, for a lot of streets, it's not good to have a bunch of driveways on it. You're better off having an access point and driveways off of that internal street network, but you do want connected streets. That's the other thing that we'll be advocating. You know, there are too many subdivisions where there's only one, maybe two ways in and out, and all the traffic loads on that. I mean, if you if you use the West Haven model, I mean, that's all about an interconnected street system, a grid or modified grid, and there's lots of different ways to go, right? Uh, and and that's, that's a great way to have traffic in it because it distributes the traffic a lot more that's evenly. Yeah, streets, right. It, Exactly, yeah. So, yes ma'am. Therapy, Georgia? Yes. Uh, I think there's aspects of it that can be implemented here in the terms of how they identify without losing the 
um, nature or preserving old trees or just it feels less dense even though there's houses right after you you know, one after the other. Yeah, so Serbi, Georgia, and have you been there, Keith? Oh, yeah, several times. I, yeah, I figured you had. I've seen lots and lots of pictures. I've used lots of pictures of it, and it's kind of interesting. It's a lot. It's sort of like West Haven, like a traditional neighborhood development, but it has this kind of environmental, like natural feel to it. Would, would you agree? Yes, it's um, I mean, it's a playing community. There's community gardens. People have the CSA where you all basically get food from the garden as being a community member. Um, all the restaurants are chef driven and they use the food that's grown on the land so it's, a, it's a definitely a, a microcosm it's not for everyone but i think there's aspects of it that you can put into any community and um enhance it it's, yeah. in, it's in a very rural area of georgia of georgia and yet it is it's amazingly vibrant yes <coughs> in terms of like people Walking. It's 45 minutes south of the airport and about an hour and 10 minutes from the city center, so it's similar to how we are to Nashville. Okay, and someone was asking, it's Sarah B. Is, is Sarah B. S E R. Oh, Sarah. Sarah. S E R. Sarah B. Yeah, I knew this would be, but I didn't know there was an N. Yes, sir. Oh, well, I had an opportunity. Yeah, Tullahoma reminds me a lot of where I lived for 25 years, which is Eastern Maryland. And Eastern Maryland was dealing with a downtown that was pretty much dead. And it took probably, I'd say, 20 years. And one of the things that they did was they started off with a plan and just stuck with that plan over a long period of time. But uh, what, what they did was something that uh, I, I got a chance to work with a developer that was instrumental in, in doing it. Is that they made a cultural center. Um, and just their, their downtown area uh, where all the cultural life came in. So they had a strong historic commission, a strong Main Street commission, um, and, and that's what brought the kids actually back to that area. Because when I moved there, there, there were no young people. No, nobody, I, I was in my third, uh, I think I was about 28. There was nobody of my age. Okay, so Easton, Maryland is a good model, particularly with their downtown revitalization. Um, Randy and I both worked in Frederick, Maryland. Have you worked in Easton at all? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and I just finished a project in Frederick, and it's a great town. It, yeah. Some of the things you just said about it remind me a lot, but you've actually worked in Easton. I've worked in Easton. Okay, I figured. He's worked everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. They have really nice, uh, several boulevards, wide boulevards with nice-sized trees, and statues and benches in them, and medians. Uh, I don't know that we have room for that, but I think 55 would have been a bit dramatic in some places, maybe Wilson Avenue as an entrance gate to the, to the town. Okay, and so she's talking about Paducah with their kind of boulevards and, you know, great entryways. And Paducah is used as a model by a lot of communities, particularly for their downtown. Uh, yeah, so. Yes, ma'am. McKinney, Texas has a fabulous town square. It's, I mean, it is, it is the, it is the cultural center. Okay, McKinney, Texas. Yes. Dallas. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, let's do one last one. Yes, sir. Um, I wasn't going to say a place, but a concept. Um, one of the things that sticks with me is the communities I go to that go above minimum for those who are differently able. Not just cutouts at the places they logically go, but I want every grandparent to be able to hang with their grandbaby no matter where they live. I want every single parent that has two people in a carriage to be able to get it up on the thing. Um, but just to shift to a place where Tullahoma where it's above minimum in compliance and towards best practices, whether it's a bathroom with adult chicken tables or just places where they can go in and eat as a whole family. Great. So accessibility for everybody and going above the minimum level of requirements that's great well listen we we're now at seven o'clock i think we advertise this as lasting till 6 30. so i appreciate your endurance hanging in there despite all of our boring information but this is so important that we get this kind of turnout because that's what's going to make this a great plan your plan and and thank you so much and you can talk to winston mary and kind of follow this project as it proceeds but I hope to see you at the next meeting thank you very much